Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here at this, um, the first of the art history lectures of the year. Um, we'll, I'll get, we'll get this thing started because I just saw there's, they're serving uh, guacamole and uh, salsa and chips, so, you know, appropriate with the uh, Mexican theme of the lecture. Sorry. Only the art historians get it. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> um, it's my great pleasure to present a good friend of mine, uh, James Oles, or as my kids call him, Uncle Jay. Um, uh, professor Oles is a professor in the art department at Wellesley College since 1996. Uh, he is also the adjunct curator of Latin American art at the Davis Museum, also at Wellesley University. Uh, right now, he has a great show that you should definitely go and see at the Wellesley uh, Museum called Art La Latin America, which is basically a survey of, no, it's not a survey, he hates that word. Um, it's a collection of their collection of art uh, of the Wellesley um, you know, College, which is a really incredible collection. Um, and it's definitely worth uh, a trip to Wellesley. And for you, for the architects, you know, there's really some amazing architecture in the campus as well. Paul Rudolph and Moneo. Bravo Moneo. You know, various other uh, important people. Um, he is right now also um, um, uh, one of the curators for a, a major exhibition on the work of Diego Rivera, the great Mexican muralist at the San Francisco uh, Museum of Modern Art, which is supposed to open in 2020. He's also um, curating what is what will be the first history of color photography in Mexico at the P Palace of Fine Arts that will also open in 2020. Um, it's really actually amazing that we have him here given how much work he has to do. Uh, we're probably taking his, of his time. Um, he is also um, one of the people who has written, um, I think perhaps maybe the most important book on Mexican um, art and architecture, a, a survey of um, the whole um, uh, kind of uh, um, period of Mexican art since the colony uh, up to the present. And, um, and so he's like really actively involved in not only the history of um, art and architecture, but uh, right now working on photography. And as you will see you know, today, something that deals with both um, architecture, photography, uh, and um, you know, kind of the thinking about culture. Uh, Thank, thanks, general. Luis. Um, um, it's also you know, when, kind of I, when I lecture that, with, uh, with the students, I don't here today read, too because um, and, uh, most of the time and he lives half of the time in Mexico City. I run over nice and, and I never can finish food. anything. Uh, so when I give a lecture like this, I, the, I am going to do a little bit uh, kind of um, cold more reading and, than I usually do. There's some do, good so food here, but forgive me for that. First of all, I want to thank Luis. Okay, so there you go. Happy almost for a decade now. So please help me welcome Professor Wolf. I thank you for pleased to write uh, his books um, as well as coming down because he's he's a great cook so it, it, believe me there is good food to be had in 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 this part of the world um, I also want to thank Janet Lewis who arranged all the hotel and everything for me um, to make this uh, trip which wasn't a very long trip actually from from Wellesley um, easy. I also want to thank, before I even start, a, a bunch of people that have helped me along the way on this project, which is an ongoing project. It's not completed yet. Um, a guy named Albert Lopez at MIT and also Luis have worked in the archives of one of the buildings uh, where these photo murals used to be. And they've been doing a lot of that archival uh, work unsuccessfully finding anything specifically that I need, but that just means that I don't have to go and look in those archives. Uh, they've really helped me in that way. Um, and uh, I've given this talk now at several other schools, at, at CUNY, the Graduate Center, uh, in Mexico City, um, and in Paris. And all along the way, you know, comments and uh, questions have really helped uh, refine my ideas, and so I hope that some of you will have some uh, questions or, or bring something to the table as well. And a version of this lecture is going to be published this year by the Art Institute of Chicago, which is uh, opening a show in this fall called Shared Vision, Art and Design in Mexico, 1940 to 1970, which focuses only on the work of women artists who are modern industrial designers uh, or designers of any type in Mexico in that period. Probably the most famous is Annie Albers, but Lola Alvarez Bravo, who I'm talking about today, is also in that show, and Clara Porcet, who I'll also mention, is in that show as well. 
So, um, I met Lola Alvarez Bravo for the first time, <coughs> excuse me, in 1990, uh, when she was in her late 80s, in her apartment in downtown Mexico City. Uh, she just, she died in 1993. So I was lucky to meet her uh, just there at the end of her life. But unfortunately, I was much more interested at that time in Mexican painters and muralists of the 1930s than in Lola's own work. And so I was asking her about these other artists, and I never really explored uh, her own work with her. But since then, since her death, I've worked on several shows of her photographs, and these projects have forced me to look more carefully at her own work, at her particular images, and, and especially doing some old-fashioned connoisseurship, down and dirty work of an art historian, just trying to figure out what the original titles and dates of many of her photographs were. Um, uh, more recently, however, I've been exploring another important but far less well-studied uh, aspect of her work. The 15, at least, photo murals that she created for government offices and corporate clients in Mexico in the 1950s. And as the title of my talk indicates, I think she's really Mexico's forgotten muralist. Uh, she, uh, as I'll say later, but I'll just tell you now, I think she was the most important woman muralist in Mexico in the 20th century. There weren't very many women working in murals, and we, can, we could talk about that in the Q&A period, why that, why that was the case. Um, but whenever there's a list of women muralists in Mexico, she's never on that list, even though I think she was the most prolific uh, of all. These two portraits of Lola Alvarez Bravo basically frame her active career as a photographer from the 1930s to the 1970s and might provide us with a bit of background about her. She was born to a rather wealthy family in the town of Lagos de Moreno um, in the state of Jalisco in 1903 and not in 1907, as she always said. But the comforts that she enjoyed in the Mexico's pre-revolutionary era uh, were not to last. A family scandal uh, sent her mother packing um, and Lola never revealed what had happened and maybe she never knew why her mother had left the family or been expelled. Her father then brought her to Mexico City, uh, but died of a heart attack soon thereafter, leaving her with, uh, to live with a half-brother. As it happened, fortunately, in the building where her half-brother lived, there was a young man that she fell in love with named Manuel Alvarez Bravo. Um, and these childhood friends married in 1925, which was a moment of great artistic ferment uh, in Mexico City. Lola had no artistic training at the time of her marriage beyond the obligatory piano lessons that a nice young girl would have been uh, studying, taking. Um, and it would take her some time to learn the photographer's tricks of the trade from her husband, Manuel, who was already interested in photography. And then, uh, in both emotionally and artistically, to break away from him. They separated formally in 1934. They won't want to get a d d divorce until quite a bit later, but they separated in 1934. And at that time, she kept both of his last names. Um, unwilling, I think, by that time, after she'd already started to make a name for herself in the Mexico City art world, to go back to being just an unknown girl named Dolores Martinez. So she kept her name Lola Alvarez Bravo, which is um, quite, quite important. In the photo montages that Lola created that I'm going to focus on in the lecture today, I think she found a way to overtly distinguish herself from the work of Manuel Alvarez Bravo, from her former husband, even more than in her still photography. Manuel was never really interested in manipulation of the negative, um, and he was never interested in making public art, though he accepted many commissions, often working alongside Lola, even after their separation, 
to photograph and document murals by the famous uh, artists like Diego Rivera and Jose Clemente Orozco for publication in books and magazines. So she was very familiar with murals from an early age because she was photographing them. Lola Alvarez Bravo was undoubtedly the most prolific and accomplished woman muralist of her generation. And she was the only Mexican woman, woman who participated in an, important, in, an impo in an important international phenomenon known locally as Integración Plástica, the integration uh, of sculpture, painting, and other visual elements into modern architectural programs which led to a renewed interest in mural painting in Mexico in the 1950s, mainly on building exteriors, and which was surely one of the key contributions of Mexico to the history of modern architecture. But all of Lola's works uh, are almost entirely forgotten today. Why? Well, the fragility of her medium, basically photographic paper mounted on composition board, or masonite, and the modifications of her sites, not only due to standard building renovations, but also to the massive earthquake that hit Mexico City in 1985, have led, I think, to their total disappearance beyond the original collages, you know, the cutout uh, photographs that she pasted together, sort of on a, at a scale of about eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Copy negatives of those collages, and then prints from those copy negatives, which we might call the photomontages, that survived, uh, that she saved in her archive. And only a precious few, in fact, far too few for, for what I would like to be able to work with, a precious few doc photographs that document their original installation. Um, in, in fact, I think because of this, until recently, Scholars uh, have discussed these images, which have been more or less known and have appeared in many books about Lola Alvarez Bravo, as studio compositions, you know, as sort of art objects, rather than as public works of art. Even more revealing, I think, and, and, and leading to this kind of erasure of these works from the history of uh, modern Mexican muralism, is the fact that Lola Alvarez Bravo herself seems to have placed very little importance on this practice at the end of her career. She never mentioned her mo photo murals in a series of extensive interviews she gave in the 1980s. Not once, not once did she ever say, you know, well, in the 50s I did photo murals too and they were great, you know, nothing. And she barely discussed them with her close friend, the late art historian Olivier de Broglie's who wrote an extended essay on her photomontages based on interviews with Lola in, the 19, in 1989. In that essay, discussing works that he dates to the late 40s or 50s, Du Bois says only this, that, quote, requested by different businesses and institutions, they resemble, her photomontages, resemble advertising posters to be exhibited in a large format, period. That's it. That's the entire historical analysis of this vast body of, of work uh, until the present. In the mid-1950s, however, Alvarez Bravo proudly announced her accomplishments as a photo muralist. She wrote a short essay for a magazine called Espacios, which is a prominent publication of the period that situated her work, in which in that essay she situated her work specifically in the context of what was known as Integración Plástica, this theori much theorized integration of murals and uh, architecture in post-war Mexico. And around the same time, she, she, she provided a curriculum for a, a, a Jewish cultural center, this Casa de la Cultura de la Juventud, where she was going to give a lecture actually on film, new paths in film. She was a great admirer of film. And this survived in her archive. And for this silly pamphlet that could be totally lost to history, I think this is the only one surviving image, but in the curriculum 
the biographic facts that she provides on the yellow page. She says where she's born, you know, that she's been involved in this literary and artistic movement. She started the first cine club. She's contributed her photographs to art books. She does documentary photography. That's half of her CV. The rest of her CV basically are all the photo murals that she's been working on. So at this, in this undated pamphlet, which I think must be around 1954, 55, she put a tremendous emphasis on her photo mural production. And if it wasn't for this surviving pamphlet, I would not have conf confirmed proof that in fact all of these photo montages that survive in her archive were in fact originally photo murals. So, th the, you know, this is the historian's, you know, um, the luck of finding the little piece of paper that allows you to then, you know, go forward. <clears throat> because other than this inventory, let's say, in her CV, um, the documentary record is extraordinarily sparse with very little surviving information on commissions or contracts, either in the buildings where she worked or in her own surviving papers. Indeed, it remains difficult to date any of her photo murals precisely, though all of them were certainly produced during the presidencies of Miguel Aleman, 1946 to 52, and Adolfo Ruiz Cortines, 1952 to 58, um, a period in Mexico, uh, late 40s and 50s, marked by what's known as developmentalism, a protectionist economic system that supported economic growth under the rigid control of the ruling party in Mexico, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, or PRI. During those two sexenios, or six-year presidential terms, the federal government built some of the nation's most important modernist landmarks, including high-rise housing blocks, new government ministries, and most famously, the new campus of the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, the UNAM, which was inaugurated in 1952. Interior and exterior murals in a variety of media were essential visual and discursive components of all of these projects. And that work almost entirely survives today, well-maintained and treasured as Mexican national patrimony. So now what I want to do is just turn to, to explore a little bit how Lola Alvarez Bravo even became involved in photo montage before we get to the photo murals themselves. Rather than her husband, Manuel Alvarez Bravo, we can locate Lola's interest in montage in her friendship with Tina Modotti, who she, uh, the Italian-born photographer who was uh, living in Mexico at that time, who Lola met in the late 1920s after Modati's companion and mentor, Edward Weston, had returned to his wife in California, around the time that Modati was working for the Communist Party newspaper, El Machete. You can see these workers here reading the newspaper. Although Edward Weston, like Manuel Alvarez Bravo, who was, his, who was following him, rejected almost any manipulation of his negatives in pursuit of a new vision, a somewhat naive belief in photographic truth, Tina Madotti's political activism and her membership in the Communist Party led her to create what were certainly the first modernist photo montages made in Mexico, surely inspired by German or Russian precedents, though little work has been done on her sources. In 1928, working for the communist newspaper El Machete, Madari created at least five of these montages, published in a series called Contrasts of the Regime. And one of them is on the right, all of which compared bourgeois life on and around the elegant Paseo de la Reforma on the top, the upper class, with uh, images of the city's poor in the streets uh, in a neighborhood known as Tepito, in the lower half or lower class. So all of these montages just about the upper class at the top with the lower class at the bottom. Um, only one of these has actually uh, been published. Um, and the montage effect is very subtle here. You can see the billboard is one photographic negative and the man sitting on the sidewalk with the wall behind him is a second photographic negative. Uh, but if 
you know, do any photography yourself, you know it would kind of be impossible to have the man in focus, the wall slightly out of focus, and then the billboard, which is really in the background, again in focus. So the focus is kind of the, the way it, we, we understand that it's a photomontage. <clears throat> I have no solid evidence that Lola knew of this particular series in El Machete, um, but she very well might have turned to it as a precedent uh, in the 30s when she created her first and equally vehement and discursive political photomontages. These two images by Lola were produced in 1935 as revolutionary posters for an exhibition sponsored by an organiza organization known as the League of Revolutionary Artists and Writers that was organized by her friend and roommate, the painter Maria Izquierdo, uh, together with other women who are all of them were employed as art teachers at that time in primary schools run by the federal government. In both, the montage, the assemblage of different elements, is far more abrupt and obvious than in Madati's work, calling attention to itself. Though as in Madati, there's a similar juxtaposition of capital in the upper sector and worker or laborers or the poor in the lower sector of the image. Again, similar work was common in German and Soviet magazines at this time, but in a later interview, Lola told Olivier de Broglie's she never saw or paid attention to such sources, although never really trust what artists say, particularly later in their lives in interviews, but um, she was disdaining these you know, European sources. Um, at, 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 anyway. In the 30s in Mexico, print media, along with radio and film, became more effective strategies for political persuasion and propaganda than murals had been in the 1920s. And photomontage had a boom beginning around 1936. Not surprisingly, Lola's other political photomontages of this per later period, uh, of the later 30s, appear in magazines. Um, some that are more uplifting, like the one on the right from a magazine that was directed to school teachers. You see these kids' heads on a new modern school being built in Mexico City. Um, or uh, some more critical, uh, like one that appeared on the cover of this magazine of the you know, League of Revolutionary Writers and Artists, Front to Front, uh, which is a sculpture, a paper mache sculpture of a worker smashing, the, you know, smashing fascism, uh, surrounded by this abstract array of buildings and skyscrapers that we'll see is, a, is an idea that Lola will return to again. Lola's montages became more visually sophisticated and complex just around the time that the use of political photomontage in Mexico in general was expanding dramatically. And uh, I, I could go into more about photomontage in general in Mexico, but time requires we get, we get to the photo murals. So I'm going to skim here a little bit. In 1946, um, one of Lola's most important jobs at, uh, of that year was to provide the photo documentation for a luxurious bound report commemorating the six-year presidential term of Manuel Avila Camacho. Indeed, over the 1940s and 50s, Lola dedicated much of her time to these official projects photographing the president's tours across the country where he was inaugurating new dams and highways and school buildings and uh, she would document literacy campaigns and the distribution of textbooks and all these sorts of, of rather boring subjects, I think, for, for an artist to be to working on. And what's interesting is that um, it's clear that Lola Alvarez Bravo never considered any of that work her art. Um, she uh, never included any of those photographs in any of her later exhibitions or publications, even though she kept most of the negatives. But some of those images that she took on these tours and, you know, the sort of the work photographs that she was doing officially found their way cropped and spliced into her later photo montages, which, by the way, never include any bits of the pictures she considered her art photographs. 
So she kept these kind of two practices separate, but the photomontages are closer to the work photographs in some way. The elegant report that she did for the government included uh, three photomontages shown here, which show a rather dramatic leap from her work of the 30s. This is 1946. First, they're less radical in, than her previous works. Um, and in, instead of emphasizing social programs or the poor, they're more dynamic, complex compositions built from many negatives rather than just two or three. And these works here in this official government uh, report are closer in both theme and style to the photo murals she creates in the 1950s. These post-war images created during a period of rampant industrialization and urbanization, which was supported by the regime, um, it, it, it reveal some of the principal themes of her later work, architecture and industry. The, uh, the first one is architecture. The second one is more about the communication systems, which we'll see she returns to. The third one on the far right is actually about uh, music, which she never d does a photo mural r related to. Um, uh, now, didactic frescoes, sculptures, and even stained glass windows had emerged as a crucial visual means of communicating official government rhetoric in Mexico in the 1920s, just after the revolution. But it remains unclear when and how Alvarez Bravo first conceptualized expanding her photomontages, which she'd been doing for magazines, basically, or posters, to mural size scale, although there were many, many precedents for this. In, in Europe and the United States. Following uh, the Russian artist El Lisitsky's early experiments in the late 1920s, photo murals proliferated in Europe in the 30s, first in Europe and the, and the United States, as modern architects embraced the medium as a rational and technologically sophisticated strategy for decoration. In New York, Photo murals were featured in a MoMA exhibition of 1933, and soon thereafter were included in the elegant decorations at Rockefeller Center. Uh, there's one example on the uh, left. Um, at the Exposition Internationale of 1937 in Paris, financially constrained governments, like those of the Popular Front France and the Spanish Republic, adopted photo murals in their pavilions as a less expensive but yet dramatically modern alternative to the traditional techniques of mosaic, sculpture, and fresco, which were employed, not surprisingly, in the very luxurious and expensive Nazi and Soviet pavilions. Women artists played important roles in several of these early projects. Margaret, the American photographer Margaret Bourke White's mural for the RCA offices at Rockefeller Center um, that you see on the left in the lobby. Um, uh, expanded her own photographs, enlarged her own photographs 100 times. This was actually con exactly contemporary with Diego Rivera's famous censored mural in uh, the same building. Charlotte Parion uh, uh, collaborated with Fernand Leger in the French Ministry of Education kiosk at the 1937 exposition in Paris, although Parion, like Alvarez Bravo and Burke White, um, unlike, I'm sorry, unlike Alvarez Bravo and Burke White, relied on found images rather than her own negatives. Now, the French photographer Giselle Freund, who lived in Mexico from 1950 to 1953, at exactly the moment Alvarez Bravo began her photo murals, had written an important review of the photo murals at the 1937 fair, which Lola never went to see. But I think the concept of the photo mural was actually introduced to Mexico more directly by the Spanish artist uh, Josep Renau, a recent exile from the Spanish Civil War, exile to Mexico from the Spanish Civil War, who had designed photo murals for the Spanish pavilion in Paris, designed by um, Luis La Casa and Josep Luis Sert. Um, and some of you are probably familiar with that building. In 1939-40, Renau collaborated with David Alfaro Siqueiros and others on a well-known mural for the Mexican Electrician Syndicate that involved the use of photomontage and slide projections, although the final work was rendered in brightly colored industrial enamels. 
Less familiar is an extensive photo mural with the utopian title, The Total Electrification of Mexico Will End the People's Misery, which he designed in 1941 to wrap around four walls of the lobby in the same building. And this is uh, part, of that, part of that project. This photo mural was never installed, uh, perhaps because of the union's limited budget, but just as likely for technical reasons. Um, I don't know that at the time it would have been possible to actually produce uh, a photo mural of this scale in Mexico, and I'll mention that in a minute, tell you that in a minute. That same decade, Renau published a widely read book on, uh, that, uh, in, in, that you see there on the right, that included a chapter on photomontage and photographic retouching, which was essential to creating these large-scale photo montages. So I think Lola, who knew Renau very well, probably got her inspiration from this, this work. But it's not only having the idea of making a photo mural, you have to be able to technically produce it. Large far format photo printing had been first developed around 1933 by the film industry in Hollywood as an inexpensive alter alternative <coughs> sorry, to painted backdrops. That's, that's where the photo mural comes from. It was quickly adopted for use in commercial billboards and then photo murals installed in, in public buildings. Photographers would send their negatives, you know, they would make a photo montage or, or just use one photograph if they wanted, um, to be amplified and then printed onto meter-wide rolls of sensitized paper or cloth, which were then painstakingly mounted onto plywood or masonite panels. And you, you had to produce these in strips. So you, you, know, you could have a wide photo montage you could just make on, 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 your, on your table, right, using cut up pieces of, of, of uh, photographs or, or negatives. But then you had to print these strips, and the strips had to have a tiny, tiny overlap so that everything, there wasn't a gap or, or any kind of uh, jo obvious joint. And then you had to sand that overlap very, very gently so that it was perfectly smooth all these joints, and then you had to var somehow varnish the entire thing to protect it from being scratched or, or, or anything. So it was really kind of a complicated process. The, this sensitized paper strips were mounted onto plywood or masonite panels um, that could then be mounted uh, onto a wall. In some cases, artists actually just applied those kind of wallpaper strips directly to the wall, but more commonly they were mounted onto panels that could then be installed uh, into a space. The technique, however, the, the ability to make these in a laboratory was rather slow to arrive in Mexico. The enormous photo enlargements of the Pedregal subdivision that architect Luis Barragan installed in the walls of his studio in the Tacubaya neighborhood in Mexico uh, already by the late 1940s may have been, if not the first, at least among the first, uh, at least in the art and architecture world in Mexico City. And it's, uh, I think, important that the first really well-documented photo enlargements of any scale that we have in Mexico are in relationship to an architect's studio, uh, because architects were the ones that were really interested in this, in this technology. Um, by the early 1950s, judging from advertisements in architecture magazines like Espacios, at least by 1952, there were uh, labs in Mexico City that were advertising the ability to produce photo murals in Mexico City, um, making photo murals practical, if not necessarily that inexpensive um, as they were in Europe and the United States. And uh, there's a period review where somebody's talking about them already uh, in general, and, and the, uh, the guy says, well, here in Mexico, the costs of development and imported materials are much more than they are abroad. Lola worked with a lab called Foto Morales Escamilla, which was one, and then there was this other one uh, that uh, you can see the ad on the right side. So there are at least two of these labs indicating some demand for making these uh, photo murals. 
though I've yet to find more information um, on either of these companies than these advertisements. The technique, however, will be of tremendous use during a decade where rapid growth of Mexico City meant there were ever more new government and commercial buildings rising in the city, creating opportunities not only for architects, but for muralists, including Lola Alvarez Bravo. And just as an aside, I want to say that um, the many architects had these photo murals in their studios in Mexico City. Mario Pani had one, uh, which no longer survives. And this is a photo mural in the office of a, an architect named Francisco Artigas from about 1975. So they, they loved having these kind of explosive arrays of all of their creations uh, behind their rather unmodern desks. Uh, you can see it's not very, you certainly didn't shop at Knoll, I can tell you that. Um, but what I want to say is that it's this, um, I think Lola Alvarez Bravo was very fortunate. She was extremely close her whole life to the architects of Mexico City and was very close friends with them, with their wives, uh, vacation together. She was, and, and so um, I, I think this is really what propels her into this field. It's this tight relationship of the artist with the architect community that she, that she had much more than many of the other muralists of her generation. Almost all of Lola's photo mural projects were done for the signature building projects of the government and also some for private industry, many of which were designed by leading national architects who tended to be close personal friends of the photographer. That's why you're not supposed to go off script because you already have it written down. Um, the, the Mexican architects were certainly inspired by how their European counterparts, Le Courbusier at the Pavillon Suisse in 1933, or Cert in La Casa at the Spanish Pavilion in 1937, had already adopted the medium as this rational strategy for decoration in keeping with de modern design theories. Um, as one scholar has argued, the photo mural was considered technologically advanced and in, in, it, in itself representative of this new era, and thus it appealed directly to modern architects who wanted to put something visually modern in the building rather than fresco or mosaic, which might have a modern subject, but which were archaic in terms of their material and manufacture. For the most part, Lola's themes would support both industry and the government. Praising, no more of that, you know, anti-capitalist stuff of the 30s totally praising capitalism, technology, resource extraction, computer systems, and official dev developmentalist policies such as highway building and the state control of communication networks. Her works, more, more, more like those in the United States, in fact, are pro-technology and pro-industry, advocating the acceleration of production and development, whether financed by the state or the pri private sector. They're never about the collective workers even when they sometimes feature isolated individuals. In fact, in the 1950s, she totally abandoned the use of photomontage as an agitational tool, avoiding chaos and conflict in her compositions, um, uh, like what we would see in the revolutionary montages of the 1930s, where the parts don't fit together very well and they kind of upset you and un are unbalanced. Uh, instead, she tries to create compositions where there's greater sense of order and stability and sometimes symmetry, all of which serve to place capitalist development in a positive light. As I've said, all of the photographic fragments in, in these murals I'm going to go talk about now derive from her own photographs rather than from images appropriated from newspapers, magazines, or other photographers. So. One last general point that I want to say before I kind of go through an inventory of some of these projects is, uh, is, is we really have to interrogate or think about her experience as a woman uh, artist and as a woman muralist. Although the works were produced off-site rather than on public scaffolds, which entailed a more grueling effort and physical presence, Lola's pr prolific accomplishments in the 50s, a de the decade just the decade when Mexican women finally got the federal vote. You know, it's late, um, obviously. Um, 
might serve to counteract or at least complicate claims that women were discriminated against as Miroists uh, throughout the post in the post-revolutionary period. As I've written about elsewhere, American women, women from the United States, were actually given several important commissions in Mexico in the 1930s. And several scholars have discussed the fact that Maria Izquierdo, Lola's close friend, was denied the ability to transform this into a mural in the stairway of the Mexico City, mainly the city hall, really, in Mexico City uh, in the mid-1940s because of the complaints of Diego Rivera and Jose Clemente Orozco. But what I would argue is that um, it might have been that Maria Izquierdo's composition was seen by those male artists uh, as rather simplistic and uninteresting. And even at first glance, you can see how Lola's work is compositionally and discursively far more complex than that of Maria Esquerdo. Um, what's, what's equally interesting, though, is that while Maria Esquerdo emphasizes a woman here as the sort of embodiment of Mexico's modern development with her blueprint and her equipment and the new building rising up above her, um, women play a very minor role in Lola's own photomontages uh, of the 1950s, as you're going to see. Although precise chronologies are impossible to determine uh, at, at this stage of my research, I think her first photo mural might have been one designed for the theater in Carlos Obregón Santa Celia's new uh, Mexican Social Security Institute completed uh, on, the uh, uh, on the Paseo de la Reforma in Mexico City in 1950. Although the first published reference to the photo mural that I have found is actually 1953. Um, the project is relatively straightforward in composition and meaning, and it draws on relatively few uh, images or, or negatives. It, these healthy, sort of tropical, decorative landscapes um, that uh, you can see here in these three kind of uh, images. And these, what you're looking at in the bottom, this is what we have in Lola's archive. You know, these just eight and a half, you know, eight by ten prints, photo prints. Um, they don't really help you understand, like, where would they have been in the space or how are they oriented. Um, the German scholar uh, Joanna Spanka recently discovered the photograph above showing the these uh, three panels installed on the curving stairway uh, in the theater in the building that no longer survives. Uh, I mean, the building survives, but the theater no longer, uh, that stairway doesn't have murals anymore. The photo mural is quite abstract, made up of these close up and distant shots of tropical vegetation, probably taken in Acapulco. Uh, the trapezoids include, in, in some places, painted images of jaguars. There's one here. And I think you can all see there's one over here. Uh, and they're painted. They're kind of montaged in by some unknown artist, which, of course, uh, makes us think that she was thinking of Henri Rousseau, paintings by Rousseau. It seems the most direct inspiration for this first, first and uh, rather unpolitical project. And it really doesn't have anything to do with the health ministry other than this is a healthy, like, tropical space that with good air or something like that, I don't know. Far more important was the series of photo murals that Lola created for the new headquarters of the uh, Secretaría de Comunicaciones y Obras Públicas, the Ministry of Communications and Public Works, known as the SCOPE in Mexico City, which opened in 1955. The visionary behind the enormous complex was architect Carlos Lasso, who was also one of the main creative forces behind the new UNAM campus and who unfortunately died uh, before either of these projects was completed. And this is an aerial view of this vast, uh, vast ministry um, for, uh, you can see it really takes up a whole triangular plot of land, enormous plot of land. And here are some close-ups of the, of the main structures um, um, as at the University City, the UNAM, the Scope Complex included exterior murals um, here by Juan O'Gorman 
and Jose Chavez Morado, who did a series of stone mosaics on the exteriors, and sculptures by Francisco Zuniga and Rodrigo Arenas Betancourt. Far less prominent for passerby on foot or in, by, in, car, in a car were the five photo murals that Lola Alvarez Bravo created for interior spaces in the scope. And in that pamphlet that I showed you earlier, she says she did them for cinco departamentos, or five different bureaucratic units. So I now believe, just from that one pamphlet, because these murals don't survive, is that they must have been in five different spaces in the building. Um, all of them address different functions of the ministry. Neither Luis nor uh, Albert Lopez, MIT grad student, have uncovered contracts in their archival work at the scope. And although traces of her murals appear as illustrations in the ministry's annual reports, I've, as so, I've so far been unable to determine their specific location within the complex or exactly what the process of the commission uh, was for these, for these works. Two of the murals, Opening Roads and Railways, depict the transportation systems funded and administered by that ministry, especially uh, in the right, the uh, National Railways of Mexico, which had been nationalized in 1938. In each, images of roads, tracks, an airport, construction crews are placed into a landscape with strong diagonals leading back to the horizon or to the future. The same worker with a jackhammer, same one, appears in both, um, the central section of both murals perhaps somehow to connect them, at least conceptually, although I do think they were associated with different spaces, one obviously in an office that was in the road department, and the other one in the railway department space in the building. Um, the railway image, like all of Lola's photo murals, emphasizes positive industrial, industrialized development. There's absolutely no hint here of the crisis that was going to lead to a violent series of strikes by the railway workers in 1958-59, which was one of the first cracks in the post-revolutionary regime, was this railway strike of 58-59. The compositions are far denser than the uh, Social Security project on the stairway. If it in fact precedes them, and I, th I speculate that it's later because the compositions are far more complex. Um, the, wor the viewer now is required to work harder to make sense of the fragments um, than, than in the earlier, the earlier project. These images, like Lola's other photo murals and following earlier precedents, express modernity through radical new perspectives and shifts in scale and dramatic shadows. Such murals express the cosmopolitanism and rationalism of her bureaucratic patrons their faith in technological and scientific progress, and in new forms of social organization that emphasize the machine over man. For although the human figure is present, he or she is generally overwhelmed by the montage rather than surging forth from it. Three other photo murals for the scope combined further references to external functions. There's a railway bridge in one place, and I can't, don't have time to point out all these details out, Ra radio towers. The Highway Patrol, I can't remember where they are, but they're there somewhere. Um, I can't remember. Uh, anyway. Um, with evidence of the internal bureaucracy, so there's references to sort of the external functions outside of the, outside of the ministry, but then to the internal functions, uh, computer punch cards, which I think gave rise to the fact that in the literature these are titled computers, but there's no evidence that these were titles that were given to them by Lola Alvarez Bravo. There's computer punch cards, adding machines, filing and printing equipment, and even images of the white collar technocrats sitting at their modern steel desks. And you can see them like one guy right here, for example. Um, uh, there's also daycare workers, doctors, machine operators, mailmen, paymasters. Um, and uh, one of these images, the one you see, this light, light gray one, uh, is only documented. It's not, doesn't, a print of it doesn't exist in Lola's own archive, but it appeared on the cover of one of the scope annual reports. And uh, Luis uh, found this uh, for me. 
And as it also shows the model of a brain, you can see there's the brain is all over the place here. There's the plastic brain, the plastic brain. I can't, yeah, there's the brain, the brain, the, you know, uh, um, this uh, anatomical model of a human head, um, as well as the out of scale photographs of hands holding pens or operating dials are optimistic references to the guiding genius behind all the bureaucratic decisions being made there at the scope, including the decision to hire Lola Alvarez Bravo as a muralist. Even more self-referential are fragments of the scope building itself, including the ornamented facade. For example, there it is right there. And you can see the scope building as well appearing within the mural itself. Um, a photograph, the photograph on the cover of the bulletin superimposes a graphic chart that states that the scope's essential purpose, and thus I think the underlying theme of all the uh, five photo murals is, quote, the coordination and improvement of tasks of construction, planning, administration, and operation. At the scope, Lola Alvarez Bravo's elegies to modern systems of communication, governance, and efficiency contrast with all the references to the past on the exterior of the building, which ground the ministry's functions in Mexico's pre-Columbian uh, and colonial and 19th century religion uh, history and also in uh, Catholic religion. Alvarez Bravo worked occasionally for Mexico's booming corporate sector uh, at the time, participating on advertising campaigns sponsored by multinationals Selenis and Olivetti. And she created at least three photo murals for corporate offices in Mexico City, including one now lost, no visual reference survives, for uh, the Cementos Anahuac, a leading Mexican company with obvious ties to the construction industry. I mean, if you're doing work for the big new government ministry, they're probably buying cement from that company, so the head of the company finds out you're doing murals and brings you over. I mean, it's a small world to Mexico in the 1950s. In her photo mural for a textile company, Hilados del Norte, or Threads of the North, located in the industrial center of Monterrey, uh, the, a, a company that was founded in 1947 as part of the post-war boom in that city, the symmetrical composition announces corporate stability with almost no acknowledgement or barely any acknowledgement of the working class. At the center, machine parts and disembodied hands holding spools of thread like victory torches, as well as the mountainous landscape in the background, which features the saddleback ridge that's a symbol of Monterey, are presented almost as if in a mirror image. It's not ex exactly a mirror image, creating that sort of spinal cord for the flanking sections which emphasize the details of the spinning machines which were essential to that thread manufacturer. Unlike most of Lola's other mural projects, her commission for Fabricas Automex, a subsidiary of the Chrysler Automobile Company, was, was actually discussed in the period and illustrated in the period. This photo mural was designed for a new office building adjacent to the company's Mexico City assembly plant, which had been designed by the architects Lorenzo Carrasco and Guillermo Rossell. The structure, which no longer survives, included an exterior mural by David Alfaro Siqueiros. This is this sort of disc-like form here, um, which is an example of how the corporate sector in Mexico in the 1950s was adopting the theories of integración plástica, which had first been developed for government buildings, uh, including housing blocks. The project was featured in the February issue of Espacios, this architecture magazine, which was directed by architect Guillermo Rossell, whose building was featured in the magazine. And the advertisement for Chrysler appeared in the magazine, which reveals at this time a very tight interwoven circle of architects, designers, patrons, editors, corporations, and artists in which Lola found herself. Now here, because it was featured in this article, we have an image from the period of the mural in situ in, this, in the main meeting room, the Sala de Juntas, with furniture designed by Clara Porcet, who's a Cuban-born leading industrial designer in Mexico. As well as the architectural project, including the interior design elements, 
the spread, the article in, in Espacios, featured Lola's only period or any uh, only statement about photomurals, in which she, uh, in that in that short, very short essay, she insists for the importance of photography alongside painting and sculpture in projects involving integración plástica. So she explicitly puts herself in with Juan O'Gorman and all these other male artists who were the main proponents, uh, along with architects, of integrating uh, the visual with the architectural. The photomural is structured uh, according to dynamic Baroque vectors that situate scenes of automotive assembly between high rises on the Paseo de la Reforma here on the left and these um, uh, excuse me, and um, with these girders, conveyor belts, and repeated fenders. These are car fenders over here, over on, on the right. The composition, which according to the artist, uh, had the theme of the force of man and machine at the service through industry of the modern city, resembles much less Diego Rivera's own images of a modern automobile plant from the early 1930s in his famous Detroit industry murals um, from the Detroit Institute of Arts, resembles much less this than this, which is a detail from Renau's 1941 never completed photo mural for the Mexican electrician syndicate. But while Renau shows the shirtless worker surging triumphantly out of turbulent protest um, clutching the skeletal hand of fascism, which is here. Get him. Here, here the naked, semi-naked worker surges out. Um, but his ballet simply ensures the production of consumer goods. Now, in the pages of Espacios, I found another a uh, series of illustrations of photo murals in a corporate office building. This is for the, uh, a building known, uh, a company called Industrias Eléctricas de México. It was in Tlanepantla. It was an appliance manufacturer, um, which was actually one of the early projects of the architect Ricardo Legorreta. But there's no credit uh, in this spread to who the artist is. And this project is not listed in, the, in Lola's sort of little biography of her project. So it's unclear, but I, I believe they're probably very much likely by her. And so I'm going to have to do a little bit more uh, work on that. Lola Alvarez Bravo's links to the most powerful figures of post-war Mexico are further confirmed by her commissions for the Universidad Femenina, a women's university founded in 1943 by Adela Formoso, a leading feminist. She actually is featured in a famous painting by Frida Kahlo, uh, who happened to be married to architect Carlos Obregón Santacilia. So you can see how this, these networks are, are getting her commissions. She also painted uh, a mural for the Mexico City law offices of O'Dwyer, Bernstein, and Correa, which I would hardly mention, except that O'Dwyer was a former ambassador to Mexico, who was a former Mexico City mayor, and was a close associate of Miguel Aleman, former president of Mexico, and that, those were in his office, and the law offices were done at least by 1953. And I haven't found images uh, of that law office commission. I want to conclude with a brief mention of just one other project by Lola Alvarez Bravo. Um, which is the only one of these uh, photo murals which is given really a specific title by her in that list uh, that she produces in the, in the pamphlet. Architectural Anarchy in Mexico City. It's also her most widely reproduced photomontage of the 1950s. She returned here to a compositional strategy she had explored in the 1930s, on the cover of Frente a Frente, and again in 1946 in the government uh, publication on the, uh, on, on the president's uh, government administration. And she also, however, in, in, in all of these, may have been inspired by this photomontage by a guy named Thurman Rotan, which appeared in a MoMA catalog of 1933 
that talked about photomurals. And I think Lola, like Manuel, were extremely sophisticated. I, I don't think she went to MoMA to see the show. But these catalogs, these MoMA catalogs circulated widely. They were printed in big runs. And uh, so she might, have, she might have been inspired by that. But she certainly can see that she's picking up on this photo montage idea that she had already explored in, in, the, in 1946. Although architectural anarchy in Mexico City, and that is Lola's original title, it appears in that pamphlet, was featured on the cover of architect Mario Pani's magazine, Arquitectura Mexico, in September 1955. The original title seems to me to indicate a possible critique of all of this skyscraper development that was going up in the post-war period. Because while the buildings uh, in the photomontage rest on firm bedrock, you can see that lava down here. That's the lava of, the, uh, of this vast zone known as El Pedregal, where Barragan built his suburban housing uh, development, where the National University was built. The crisply delineated towers above, among them the National Lottery Building, and uh, here, and Mario Pani's own uh, Hotel Plaza here, the Torre Latino Americana here. These are really some of the iconic, famous buildings in Mexico, as long, alongside other apartment and office blocks. They all seem to be jostling for space, crowding out this poor little equestrian sculpture of Simon Bolivar over here, and totally overwhelming any sense of the human scale. There's some people walking along here, some cars parked along here. Um, dwarfing all of that uh, in the lower level and not stable, but rather seeming to tilt, which in a city like Mexico City, where we have earthquakes, is something that you never want to see or feel, is a building in any way off center, not <laughs> perpend you know, perpendicular to the ground. So I think for a Mexico City audience in particular, there's something unnerving, not, ab not about the dynamism of the modern city, but about the shifting scale of the, um, uh, and, and in a longer version of this, I mean, there's a lot of uh, other uh, images that I could talk about. This photo mural actually, sorry about the bad quality of the images on the right, but this photo mural actually appeared um, in the, uh, as a backdrop in the set um, depicting an architect's office in a 1955 film called La Rival or The Rival which was discovered, um, these images were discovered by a, a PhD student named Cristobal Andres Hakome at UT. The magazine cover and the film are both from 1955, but according to the artist in that pamphlet, relying on that pamphlet, the photo mural was, quote, presented in Paris. Uh, and I speculate that it might have been made for the major exhibition of Mexican art uh, organized in 1952 by Mexican curator Fernando Gamboa and shown at the Palais de Tokyo at that time. Because Gamboa commissioned several Mexican artists to make large-scale paintings for that, for that show. In the pamphlet, Lola says that it was displayed for six years in the Palacio de Bellas Artes. I don't have any further documentation, but it would have then if it were true, it would have shared hallowed space there with painted murals by Rivera, Orozco, and Siqueiros. Lola Alvarez, Lola Alvarez Bravo's, sorry, Lola Alvarez Bravo's photo murals represent the most important public works of art produced by a Mexican woman artist in the 1950s. But they also form part of a surprisingly extended and international ter uh, and, and int uh, surprisingly extended territory of Mexican production whose contours are only slowly being fully understood and documented, in which other less well-known artists also participated. Raul Estrada Discua, a, an, a Honduras-born photographer long employed at the UNAMS uh, at, the, at the university, created photo murals for uh, a construction company on the Reforma Avenue, as well as uh, photo murals for several Mexico City exhibitions. And these two images show photo murals by a woman named Maria Teresa Mendez, 
who later became a prominent furniture designer, not a modernist furniture designer. It's pretty kind of neo-colonial-ish, if you want to even call it that. Um, but she produced, in the 50s, photo murals as well, perhaps also under the guidance of Fernando Gamboa. She created at least three for the Mexican section at the Milan Triena Triennale, curated by Mexican architect Mauricio Gomez Mayorga in 1957-58, where Clara Porcet presented furniture designs. And this is a design by Clara Porcet here. And uh, for many years, uh, these have been published. There's two or three uh, uh, images of this exhibition with these big photo murals. And everybody thought it was an exhibition that Clara Porcet had done for Mexico City's Palacio de Bellas Artes. And they are always were credited to Lola Alvarez Bravo. But recently, scholars have discovered that they were by this woman, Maria Teresa Mendez. Um, she also was responsible for these photo enlargements uh, uh, at the Me for the Mexican Pavilion at the Brussels World Fair in 1958. Um, in 1964, however, there was just one sad photo mosaic, which no longer survives, which depicted Mexico's different indigenous groups installed in the introductory gallery of the new Museo Nacional de Antropología, uh, 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 built by Pedro Ramirez Vázquez, which opened in 1964 to international acclaimed, acclaim. Photo murals, I think, were considered beyond this sort of document of me different Mexican Indians, indigenous groups. Other than that, phot photography was considered unworthy of the main exhibition halls of that national showpiece. And instead, old-fashioned frescoes and monumental oil paintings would serve as the backdrops to the glories of Mexico's pre-Columbian past and to the richness of its current uh, ethnographic uh, cult uh, cultures. More surprisingly, Lola herself completely abandoned the practice, perhaps in part because of shifting government contracts or contacts, fewer mural programs being installed in state buildings, or her own renewed focus on what she called her art photography. Were it not for a couple articles in Espacios and that surviving pamphlet, I'd have barely had enough evidence to even craft this essay. And many questions still remain. Um, why were they not better discussed and documented in the period? Do any of them survive in the hidden closets of some government ministry or office building? These are questions I can't answer yet and what, that make this really a continuing and still exciting research project. Thank you all. I don't know if anybody has a question or wants to go eat dinner. Or, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Well, you know, murals were being done in, in Mexican hot, uh, hotels. Uh, um, I don't know, the first one's probably around 1932. We already start to see them. Diego Rivera does a couple hotel mural projects, uh, one in the 1930s that's very famous, and another in the 40s. I haven't found any evidence uh, of Lola working in the, in, the, in the tourist industry, you know, like tourist pamphlets or uh, any of that kind of material, which I'm pretty familiar with and, and, and um, studied quite a bit of, or in any hotels. And, and what I've been able to kind of figure out is that I, I've, I, th there's a lot of surviving images in her archive, and then there's this list, and there's a couple other things, and I've kind of figured out all of the ones, at least, that there's any historical evidence for her doing. I think if she'd done any in a hotel, she probably would have had a list in that pamphlet, because the pamphlet seems to be pretty complete. So no, I don't have any evidence that she worked 
for the hotel industry, although she, I, I'm sure she wouldn't have disdained it, you know, not in this period. I have no idea how much she was paid for these projects. Um, I, I, you know, I have no, there's no trace of it. It's, it's just, it's, I have to just say, it's unbelievable to me that Olivier de Broglie, who knew her so well and interviewed her so extensively on the photo murals, never pursued it. I mean, he was a great scholar and a great art historian, that he never pushed her. Like, where were they, Lola? Where? You know, what did you, nothing. So I, th I think she, I'm not, I'm not sure she kind of disdained this practice. Maybe she just didn't see it as art, you know, and that in the later years she really wanted to emphasize her art photography to position herself like Manuel is sort of a, a major art figure rather than somebody who had done these pro-government, pro-corporate, not very politically uh, revolutionary images. But I was just going to ask about her political convictions. I mean, is there any sense of what those were from um, this other work that was done? Are there any letters and documentation of how she sees herself politically? No, there's, she had, you know, this is a woman who had, who, um, who had many, many friends in the, uh, you know, she was friends with everyone in Mexico City. She, took almost everybody's portrait. She was intimate friends with people like Rufino Tamayo and his wife, and she knew everybody. You know, in Mexico City, she wasn't writing letters to these people because they were all in Mexico City. There are no personal letters in her archive. And I don't know if this is because um, she destroyed them, uh, although we did find some love letters from Manuel to her that are very uninteresting, you know. My dear, you know, Love Bunny, you're so beautiful. You know, for a historian, they're kind of uninteresting. Um, she did save those, though. Um, one thing I have to say is that when Lola was, so, so we don't have a lot of evidence. Um, what we do know, you know, she was in the Lear, in this League of Revolutionary um, Writers and Artists. But everybody joined that around 1934 in Mexico City. I mean, even Tamayo, every single artist, many of whom disdained politics, advocated art for art's sake, what was called in Mexico pure art, uh, they all joined that bandwagon in 34, 35. I mean, the threat of fascism, the fear of the changes taking place in the world were so pressing at that moment that everybody got involved. And then, you know, well, yeah, with all of the shifting politics of the 30s and the Communist Party going this way and that way and the Hitler-Stalin pact, you know, so many people just drifted away from the party after that initial moment of enthusiasm. I don't have any evidence she ever joined the Mexican Communist Party, for example, at all. So I think she was a nice girl from a nice family, nice background, who, like many people in the 30s, briefly started to do some political imagery. Manuel Alvarez Bravo also did two or three political images around that time. Rufino Tamayo, just two or three political images of workers' strikes and protest right around that time. And then they all abandoned it and went back to a sort of more art for art's sake, uh, art, art for art's sake approach. And certainly her friends in later years tended to be members of, those of you, you know, know anything about Mexican art, but this group, of writers and artists around a magazine called the Contemporaneos, who were the, they were the ones advocating pure art, art for art's sake. That was her intimate circle. Um, she was closer to them than she was to people like Rivera or Siqueiros, even though she was friends with those artists as well. You are, you judged by who your friends are, you know, if you don't leave any other documentation. You know, yeah? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a very hard one to say. Again, what I, what I think is that the, uh, the political demands, the fears that people had in the world in the 30s, yeah. particularly around the time of Hitler coming to power, 33, were such that a lot of people were shocked into wondering, and because of the Great Depression, yeah. wondering whether, in fact, capitalism was going to continue and whether it was in fact 
going to continue well enough to even to protect the basic needs of, a, of the society. And there, were a lot of, there was a lot of doubt, even from the capitalist sector, even from the right, there were doubts about whether capitalism was going to be an effective economic system given the depression and the threat of fascism facing the world. By the, the post-war period, capitalism is triumphant. And the United States is triumphant. And the, this developmentalist approach to building economies is turning out perfect. Buildings are rising. Factories are being built. The consumer economy is thriving. And so there's a much more optimistic view about capital uh, in the night, late 40s and 50s than there is in the mid-30s for, for you know, just ec obvious reasons. So I think that probably explains a lot of it, um, as well as the fact that I, I truly doubt that her commitment to the left was that deep. I don't want to say that it was um, superficial or, uh, you know, flippant, but, uh, you know, it, 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 wasn't, it do, do, doesn't get maintained the way it does for people like Diego Rivera, Siqueiros. They're committed to the cause all the way till their death, uh, but not for Lolo or many of her contemporaries. Okay. Thank you, Thank you all for coming.